For the first set of concluding remarks, we're very excited to have John C. Havens, Regenerative Sustainability Practice Lead at the IEEE Standards Association. How y'all doing? What's up, Athens? <laughs> so I want to ask you a question. Um, what gives you a sense of worth that connects you to yourself, other people, and the planet? Uh, my dad got a sense of worth from being a psychiatrist. His life's purpose was based on helping people remove negative pain from their lives. When he died in 2011, I merged my passion for technology with the study of well-being that led me to write a book in 2014 called Hacking Happiness, Why Your Personal Data Counts and How Tracking It Can Change the World. It was in researching this book I discovered how thoroughly our data represents our identity in the world of technology and artificial intelligence. It's also where I discovered the science of positive psychology. Whereas traditional psychoanalysis says, how can we remove someone's pain? Positive psychology asks, while we remove the pain, how can we also increase well-being? Or in other words, how can we move beyond simply addressing harms to help someone flourish? The science says this can happen for a person when they practice gratitude for themselves or engage in acts of altruism for others. Living in this way brings connection to self and to others in joy. This is true for all humans, anywhere in the world. That's what the science shows. So my last book, Artificial Intelligence, Embracing Our Humanity to Maximize Machines from 2016, I did a lot of research on the metrics of well-being. These metrics provide quantifiable and qualitative instruments to account for and improve long-term human flourishing while also honoring nature. The UN Sustainable Development Goals fall into this category, as does the excellent work of the OECD in their seminal Better Life Index and their new Center on Well-Being, Inclusion, Sustainability, and Equal Opportunity. These types of metrics account for things not measured by economic instruments of growth and isolation. But what you measure matters, and who and what you don't measure are not accounted for literally. And typically, by not being measured, they're harmed. Using these well-being metrics, however, is a way to connect all people on the planet in complement to existing measurements of GDP. Nobel laureate in economics Joseph Stiglitz, one of my heroes who I got to meet, noted in his 2009 report that the time is ripe for our measurement system to shift emphasis from measuring economic production to measuring people's well-being 2009. It is high time we adopt this thinking regarding the design, creation, and regulation of artificial intelligence systems, frontier, dual use, or any type of AI. And we need to use the term AI systems versus just AI, because that reminds everyone that these amazing technologies are powered by human and planetary data we must always account for. While we have to understand the risks that can happen with these systems, we must also recognize the overarching harms that currently, currently exist from not prioritizing ecological flourishing and human well-being as the top societal metrics of success for these tools. I work for the IEEE Standards Association, and in terms of technical connection, by the way, enjoy the horrible segue, in terms of the technical connection, we're all connected to Wi-Fi because of a standard called 802.11. Anyone here created standards? If you have, it's hard work. It involves a lot of intense discussions over years where people must ensure they're best communicating how certain technologies can be interoperable anywhere in the world. In 2016, IEEE brought together what would become over 700 global experts in a similar process of interdisciplinary consensus building. Many of you are here, old friends. Consensus building to create a compendium document called Ethically Aligned Design, the subtitle of which is A Vision for Prioritizing Human Well-Being for Autonomous and Intelligent Systems. The 2017 version of this document inspired organizations like the OECD, 
IBM, and dozens of others to help create their AI principles, and by the release of the 2019 version of the paper, the IEEE 7000 series of standards focusing on the intersection of technological interoperability and applied ethics had grown to encompass over a dozen working groups and standards. IEEE is also proud to have co-founded this very Athens Roundtable with a dear friend of mine. Here she is in the audience. You want to raise your hand, Eileen Locke. Eileen Locke is just, talk to Eileen. You will learn about 48 years of expertise in five minutes. And Nico and all the folks at Future. Um, by the way, quick round of applause for this beautiful event so far today. Just saying. So we were proud to help found the Athens Roundtable five years ago, um, but I did want to give an example of how standards can help govern AI systems with a people and planet perspective. Here's a couple examples. The IEEE 7010 recommended practice for assessing the impact of autonomous and intelligent systems on human well-being was actually the first standard in our 7000 series to launch in 2020. It provides what we call a well-being impact assessment that Frontier and all AI systems designers and users can implement to discover the innovation and value that comes from scenario planning utilizing well-being metrics. For instance, it's well known that LLMs use a great deal of water to cool servers and data centers. And by the way, planet, the planet I use the term she for planet, we talk about like guardrails and all these other things. We gotta take care of her because what she decides to do, we're gonna do. <laughs> so putting her first is pretty important. Anyway, it's known that uh, LLMs use a great deal of water to cool servers and data centers, but that water won't be available for more than a few years if water scarcity issues and aquifer depletion aren't measured at the outset of design before funding is even allocated for a specific data center. Working with local communities, farmers, and indigenous populations using well-being metrics means creating the accountable basis for long-term business and AI development. Sustainability, by definition, means long-term. In terms of using metrics to embrace people who are often not accounted for, and in terms of people who must be at the table in these conversations, IEEE is a standard working group creating a recommended practice for the provenance of indigenous people's data that we believe, the group tells us, because we work with volunteers to the indigenous folks in the group, it may be the first international indigenous data standard. We must avoid the erasure and colonization of people's language and culture with these AI systems. Do you all know the term free, prior, and informed consent? Raise your hand if you don't know what free, prior, and informed consent is. It's okay if you don't, I didn't. Please learn that. If you don't know the legal aspect of free, prior, and informed consent when working with indigenous folks, then you aren't working with indigenous folks from what they tell me in ways that they want to be worked with. Finally, in terms of people we must universally include and prioritize in all of our systems, and I'm not sure that they were talked enough about today, they never can be, the IEEE 2089 standard for age-appropriate design released in 2021 provides organizations a framework to practically orient design processes for age-appropriate digital services towards responsible technological innovation inclusive of children. Anyone here know any children in their lives? Have you heard of children? <laughs> children, anybody? It turns out all humans, when they start off, I have scientific basis to this, start off as humans. It also turns out that universally, while we have different ethical and cultural traditions, who here is a parent? Raise your hand if you're a parent. We all love our kids. I have friends in China, you know what I want? I want their kids to be okay. And all parents in general love their kids. But here's the thing, we all know that technologies more and more now, kids age 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, harvesting data, tracking eyes, etc. Sometimes there's a line in the ground. Call it morals, call it ethics, call it responsibility, but also call it teaching people that their data has worth. This is critical, and I should point out what's really exciting is that standard age-appropriate design is based on law that came from the United Kingdom. And now it's also been approved as regulation by Governor Newsom in California, but it's being challenged. All these beautiful systems, they're like a car. You know what powers them? Gasoline or, or now ho hopefully more days electricity. All these beautiful systems are powered by data, our data or data from nature. And here's the thing about kids. Kids exist right now. 
their rights, data, and identity need to be protected whether or not this thing on, whether or not AGI ever comes into being. AGI is beautiful currently from my scientific friends who tell me speculation. But kids exist now. And here's a fact, a metric we should be aware of. Loneliness and isolation have been declared an epidemic by our US Surgeon General, Dr. Vivek Murthy, and globally by the World Health Organization. Kids need to be told by this community that they have worth simply for being born. Do you think the messages from the media that says, AI just did this, AI just beat you, AI just did this, AI just beat this, I work in mental health, it's harming the kids. And I don't mean to be like, let's take care of the kids, but I kind of mean, let's take care of the kids. Loneliness is an epidemic that can be helped by AI, but not when underlying the logic is, we take your data without permission. And kids need to know that our generation is prioritizing the planet over profit. Along these lines, IEEE has a new program called Planet Positive 2030 and a new series of 7,800 standards focused on the concept of regenerative sustainability and design. The idea of regeneration involves a transformation of the heart and the mind to understand that sustainability does not just mean minimizing emissions to avoid regulation. It means back, giving back more to the planet with everything we do, with all the technology we create our kids and the planet, the living land and our ancestors. These are the stakeholders that matter the most. We must see them, see them and account for them. The GDP was not created to account for nature, for women, for kids. That was back after the Second World War. GDP and beyond means we use those metrics, but other things. I wanna thank the Future Society for this chance to talk and for our speakers and panelists, I especially pre appreciate it. She's not looking, but the talk from Global South that you gave, I wanted to give a shout out to you. This region is so critically important to listen to in terms of planetary safety. I can't tell you how many sustainability conversations I'll have where we don't have someone from Brazil or South America. And I'm like, Amazon, anybody, world's lungs? We have to have perspectives beyond global North or Western ethical traditions, by the way, that also tend to prioritize rationality as the cornerstone and the be all end all of intelligence, wisdom, or consciousness. I'm a Westerner, I love Aristotle, love me some eudaimonia, but it turns out there's other traditions beyond the West. It's the relationality and connection of community and caregiving, caregiving, that will help us ensure the value of these beautiful AI systems does not come primarily with metrics of growth or speed that risk devaluing human and planetary worth. Rather, we must prioritize people and the planet as the metrics for responsible AI together. And I was asked in closing by two people, which is when I will do this, because I did this back six or seven years ago in Dubai, um, to play harmonica, because um, I actually, I'm a Screen Actors Guild actor. When you talk about copyright, talk to someone who makes their living with the copyright of their face. I used to be in the SAG Screen Actors Guild, and I've been a musician for years. And we didn't really talk about the, the language of music or have artists up here, right? Artists should be a part of these conversations. Okay, and before our final speech from Yolanda, um, this is to think about all these amazing people we had today and all what's gonna happen when in future conversations, I always like to say this, who's not in the room? The young people, the marginalized, the indigenous, and I for one am very much looking forward to listening more than talking. But for right now I'm gonna play, and then Yolanda's gonna come up and we're gonna be done. So we asked him like three minutes ago, he just had it with him, ready to go. <laughs> okay. Society, the public globally, will be on the receiving end of the benefits and of the harms of AI. But neither the public, civil society, 
nor representative bodies like governments are sufficiently involved in directing how technology unfolds or in setting guardrails. Rather, the status quo is that the private sector, primarily very large technology companies, are determining decisions that affect us all. So we need requirements, including legally binding legislation to credibly set guardrails for AI development and deployment to address wide gaps in safety, ethics, security, control, and alignment of AI systems. Currently, while AI developers and countries have endorsed principles, competitive markets are fast-paced, leading developers to bypass their principles in favor of deploying products to market without adequate safeguards. This includes an increasingly urgent discussion on guardrails for open source AI, which brings benefits of democratizing access with risks of proliferation of powerful, powerful technologies that can be used for harm. For example, open access to model weights enables anyone to remove guardrails. I've also noticed from San Francisco and beyond, a false dichotomy and polarization among our communities. Many AI policy recommendations do address ethical and safety risks, the latter of which are nearer and nearer term, including malicious use and the loss of control, security, and alignment of increasingly powerful systems, now often open sourced. In order to harness the benefits, we need guardrails in place ex ante to prevent loss of public trust. The case we saw, for example, from a few disasters in nuclear power, which destroyed public trust and limited us from the benefits of nuclear energy. So let's get this right the first time before accidents keep us away from the benefits or lead to major ethical or catastrophic harms. Thanks, everyone.